Welcome everyone. Another great show today. Innovation Coffee, ML and IoT Deep Dive with Microsoft Azure IoT device. I'm really excited. Hi, Robert. How are hey, you? Hey, Alessandro, how's it going? Cheers. Is it is it coffee or tea? <laughs> tea. <laughs> All right. What do you have what do you have up there? I see a a little guy up there. A little raccoon. A little raccoon. This is this is a, uh, uh, it took a lot of work yesterday. I went out and captured the Microsoft developer advocate. <laughs> perfect for today. <laughs> yeah, perfect for today. So, so um, what do we have in store for today, Alessandro? We got an awesome show. We've got two guests and two demos today. So we're fortunate. We're going to talk about ML and IoT and how it all can be done uh, from cloud to edge. So I'm really excited about today's show and uh, and our guests. We'll bring them in really, really soon. But before that, Robert, do you want to give a bit of a recap on what we did last week? Absolutely. And uh, thank you, Alessandro. Uh, so last week, it was really fun. We had one of our ARM innovators, Andre Workington uh, from VMware. He is actually the ARM enablement architect over there. And we talked about ESXi on ARM. This was an announcement that came out during the ARM Dev Summit in early October. And so far, it's just gotten so much attention on uh, all the social media networks from developers all around the world. People are just downloading it like crazy. So this is one of the first times that they provided this ISO fling. So you can go download ESXi, put it on a lot of different ARM devices. And I don't want to spoil it for you as I <laughs> as I try not to do at the beginning of these episodes. But um, go check it out. If you, again, if you have an extra hour in your day and you want to go uh, uh, check out ESXi on ARM, uh, check out the VMware Fling. Last week's episode is available for you in the YouTube channel, ARM Software Developers. Thanks, Alessandro. Awesome. I think we're ready for our first guest then. So let's bring Pamela Cortez. Let's bring her in. Hey. Hey, Pamela. everyone. I was <laughs> frantically retweeting the tweet <laughs> for the live Ooh. stream when you were saying, Ed, let's bring her in. I was like, oh, <laughs> Sin, I don't know if I you know, spelled everything correctly, but I retweet it. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, guys. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Excited to be here. So I do love the little raccoon, um, our little developer advocate uh, mascot. We He actually has tons of critter friends, Little, a uh, lot of little raccoons and bears and everything. I must say, I really love it when when a, a company, especially a tech company, comes up with, you know, some form of mascot. Like, I mean, GitHub has the cat octopus. Um, Octocat, uh, yes. Yeah, Octocat, <laughs> there you go. And, uh, you know, Android, of course, the little Android. Mm -hmm. And then even the little dinosaur that runs around um, uh, when you when you don't have internet and you try to load up something on on, a, on your browser. <laughs> oh, so, it's, yeah. yeah, it's one of my favorite things. It's, it's one of those things where if you have a product and you have the best best branding with these little guys, uh, and then you have to, you know, retire the product. That's a little heartache <laughs> because I couldn't even imagine Octocat going away. So it's, it's GitHub has got to be here forever because it's, we got such a loyal, loyal base of Octocat fans out there. Yeah, yeah, we could we could step into my other dungeon. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we'll keep we'll keep we'll keep it with a you know dead advocate. <laughs> wow, you had Tux. You had wow, you had all of the classics. <laughs> yeah, I spend, I, that's how I spend my weekends. You know, just trapping tech tech mascot. <laughs> but um, you know, it's really awesome to have you here, and uh, you know, I'm I'm glad that you brought your special cup today. I mean, I what, what is that actually? That's is that it's is that it's lobster? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a ray gun, but it, oh, it also can oh. be a sci-fi lobster. Uh, so it's a robotic lobster <laughs> with a little uh, claws. Awesome! Yeah. So really happy to have you on the show, and uh, excited for you know all the stuff that you've got to show and to talk about. Um, so before we we dive into the tech stuff, though, I'm really curious about your story, right? Like I think uh, we're all here. Uh, doing developer advocacy. And, and it's interesting to have someone else that's doing developer advocacy from other, another company. And I'd love to hear you know, how you got to this point, like what brought you to this weird world, right, of developer advocacy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, well, I think where I'm at now with focusing on IoT, I've been actually focusing on IoT for, for 
a really long time. I don't want to say how long. <laughs> it's been over a decade. Um, but uh, but I started my journey as a web developer. Um, and actually, each part of my career, I really think, got me to go to focus on IoT and be a developer advocate. Uh, but yeah, I started off as a web dev. Uh, and then uh, the recession hit. Um, and no one wanted websites. And so I had to take a take a different swing of things and uh, you know, was trying to find what's next. Uh, so I ended up uh, bartending <laughs> and doing other jobs, which I like to always kind of mention, uh, mention that just because uh, I get questions a lot on, I wanna join tech, but I don't have a degree in tech or I am a nurse and I'm interested in joining tech or you know, I was in tech to begin with and then I exit out for a little bit, can I come back? Uh, and so I'm a big fan of letting people know you can come back, uh, anyone can join uh, and we really need need all of these different people from different backgrounds and uh, being inclusive, diverse uh, backgrounds to come join tech. But uh, at the heart of it, uh, I feel like bartending actually got me to, to learn how to be a therapist. So when people are debugging their hardware and they're flipping out, I'm there to calm them down and help them out. Uh, but uh, no, my, my journey kept going. I ended up uh, landing on a production floor, focusing on running pick and place machines, and then getting into hardware engineering, uh, which sounds like a, a leap, but uh, you know that was a that was the job that I fell into and was excited about. Um, and then I ended up at Spark Fun Electronics uh, due to you know being a self taught engineer. Um, and uh, Spark Fun was pretty much me coming up with uh, demos. I was their connected. Uh, device developer advocate. Uh, so I sat in engineering, developing boards, uh, making demos on pranking my coworkers, um, and got into really the development of the hardware side, which is a big part of IoT, and then joined Microsoft to run the IoT global programs for uh, uh, developer experience org. So what we were doing with uh, IoT and getting people excited about IoT, uh, I was leading those programs and ended up doing a lot of um, uh, programs like ML on the edge with customer and partners, code with initiatives with them. So I've spent a lot of time coding with partners and customers when it comes to ML on the edge, which is why I'm super excited to talk to you guys. Um, and then I ended up on the product team. Uh, so uh, focusing on device developer communities and being their advocate. Uh, so I've been an advocate for a long time, but it's just been nice to actually have that as a title <laughs> um, <laughs> at Microsoft. Yeah. Awesome. Really, that's, yeah, that's awesome. really interesting. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's really interesting to hear that story. And uh, uh, we've got actually a couple of comments in the in the chat. So there is uh, Louise that says, I like that. I don't have a degree either. And I, I have also done bartending. So, uh, <laughs> so she's, join, join us. <laughs> yeah. she, she works in our, I mean, she's she's a colleague. Oh, and, uh, I love that. She's, uh, yeah, she's uh, she's actually not a developer advocate, but she's, uh, she's in the developer advocacy team, right? So... <laughs> I mean, there's, so you know, it's it's a path, right? We have uh, um, OC or AOC. She bartended, and now she's <laughs> she's a politician. So there's, you know, maybe that's a, a interesting career path. But no, that's that's great to hear because there's so many like my coworkers. I, I work with past musicians, people who used to go to Berkeley uh, for you know music, and now they're going into tech, and people who are you know doing these boot camps and going online training and then getting into tech uh, and becoming a developer. It's, it's really exciting. It's exciting to, to have more people join us. Yeah, I did a, I, I actually, I mean, to, to echo all of this, I was in the restaurant industry for like eight years or nine years. And oh, wow. um, yeah. I, yeah. I remember cause I, I moved to the United States from Mexico and I knew I wanted to be something with math and physics and, and, uh, and then sure enough, uh, after I screwed up too much, my parents cut me off. And, what, what do you do? I go become a bus boy and then a host yeah. and then server and, you know, and go through that whole, whole mm -hmm. thing while paying for school. But I mean, gosh, does working in the restaurant business just teach you so much about yeah. multitasking and dealing with people. And you brought up kind of like the whole psychology about it. And I, I think that it's, it's definitely a great path for anyone who is, 
um, entertaining that, you know, like going to community college and working your way up, up the, up the rings there. Um, the restaurant business is really cool. I want to point this out also, Arjit joins us again. Um, and he says, yeah, he has zero degree. It's a 14 year old. He's doing so much cool ah. tech stuff. I just love having him on the call. Yes. So thank you for joining us again, Arjit. That's exciting. I'm, oh yes, it's, it's great to meet you. Thanks for joining. And I love that, uh, I love your comment and that you're you're playing with tech already and uh, you're gonna you're gonna do amazing things. Uh, and I, I already know you're gonna outpass me and like tomorrow. <laughs> all of us, <laughs> so, all of us for sure. <laughs> yeah, all of us. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. exciting just because uh, seeing like, especially younger generation, now they have access to like Scratch and drag and drop programming and learning with Python and everything else. And just being able, like it's, it, code is gonna be one of those uh, subjects that everyone's going to to learn. Um, it's gonna be just like math, you're gonna have computer science and, and schools, I hope. Mm, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So, I mean, you talked about the fact that you got, you know, after a long journey, you got actually in IoT, right? And I'm, I'm really curious about your insights on what are the big trends that you're seeing in the, in the industry today. And perhaps like we could also maybe uh, highlight one of, you know, aspects of one of the trends that I think is one of the biggest right now, uh, machine learning. So, you know, maybe combine the two things, IoT and machine learning, and tell us what you're seeing in the industry from your perspective. Yeah, so we, you know, machine learning has had an interesting, uh, you know, um, journey in the IoT space, right? Because, you know, first we were just collecting data, sending it up to the cloud, then machine learning became a big part of the cloud. Uh, and so then it became, hey, can we get this AI and this uh, intelligent workload from the cloud onto devices? And so then it was, you know, gateway devices, uh, edge devices, where you're running all of these AI workloads. And now more and more, you're having smaller, smaller footprint devices uh, focusing on bringing ML to it. And so that's the biggest trend when it comes to ML is that you have ML on the edge uh, with these kind of beefier devices. Uh, and then you have uh, actually what can we do with microcontrollers? Uh, can we bring in ML with microcontrollers? So you have tiny ML, you have uh, the Edge Impulse team doing a phenomenal job with what they're doing with uh, different devices. Uh, and so it's exciting to see kind of that, that journey of bringing all the data up, doing the ML, bringing it back down. So I, I I can't tell you how many events I've been doing in the last year and a half where the most questions have been, are you bringing uh, machine learning to MCUs? What are you doing in that space? Uh, so it's, it's pretty exciting to see what's coming up. And it's, it feels like the uh, Wild West still, though, <laughs> in, in, in that area. I, that, that, that last that last comment that you just mentioned right now, um, I mean, this, there's got to be so many things that, that, at least so many things come into my mind right now, right? Like when you're thinking about you mentioned data coming from uh, out from the data centers out into the you know the devices, and now we have all this ML at the edge. Um, the attack surface increases now, right? Like there's different chipsets out there, different boards out there, and so you have all these edge devices. Um, have I mean, I, can you talk a little bit to that? I know like there's some projects mm -hmm. out there like Parsec, the platform abstraction for security that we're working on here at Arm with you know the Cloud Native Compute mm -hmm. Foundation, but. Can you talk a little bit about kind of like how you see the security narrative around these edge devices um, in the future, all this ML going on? Yeah, you know, I, I love that you bring up security with this because I think that's a huge, huge, huge discussion I've been having with a lot of partners and uh, customers, uh, mostly because they have IP that's actually sitting on those devices, right? Um, so they have, you know, uh, when it comes to protecting their, AI models on the edge, they want to be able to protect that work. So if someone has access to that device, uh, you know, they can't take the IP. And so there's definitely been um, confidential computing that we've been working with um, different foundations and um, focusing in that area of how do you protect that data on the device side. And then also when you're sitting up data up to the cloud uh, from edge devices, how do you protect it in its journey and that connectivity, uh, that's another area. Um, 
I worked with a, a, a partner that was doing autonomous vehicles and we were trying to solve, you know, especially with a lot of these regulations that are happening um, in, in Europe. Uh, so GDPR, uh, there's more and more of these regulations. And when we were training videos, so we had a car that was driving around collecting video, we couldn't actually collect uh, information on people's faces because that is, you know, very protected in that particular area. And so we needed to make sure that when we actually had the data on the device, uh, we had AI models that were blurring out the face and making sure to take out any recognizable information uh, and going ahead and storing that and making sure even when it's on the device side, how do you how do you protect that that data and also do some cleaning out of some data too? Uh, and so this is a very interesting space. Uh, I'll definitely link some some links on the chat of what we're doing there, but confidential computing, uh, we have a lot of security on edge and on the cloud side to protect uh, to protect the data that's coming in and out of these devices. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that's also, Yeah. Thanks for something that you brought up. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. <laughs> no, no, I was just gonna say thank you. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, no, it's interesting you brought that up, and I think you know the fact that uh, you were saying about this cyclical. It's almost like a cyc cyclical uh, thing, right? Like before it was all all cloud. Now it's going to the edge. Maybe it will be cloud again oh, yeah. at some point. But you know, machine learning is moving to the edge, and and it's it's interesting because you were talking about security and privacy, and actually one of the aspects that's really important here is that. Uh, by being more on the edge, you can actually decide what you're sending to the cloud. I always think, you know, cloud exactly. is, is is still there, right? Like you can still use it. It's not like nobody's saying not to use the cloud ever, right? It's more mm -hmm. about you use the cloud when it makes sense. And and the, the cool thing about having the capabilities on the edge is that you don't need to send all the data to the cloud. So you can make sure that you're sending the data that, you know, maybe it's not, it's not like confidential data or whatever other data you might yeah. not want to share. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is also one if you're doing the processing on the edge, you can also throw away data that's not you know that's not interesting. Uh, so mm -hmm. you don't have to store it anywhere, perhaps. And and that you know that's another way to yeah but I, make sure exactly. You know, so I mean, this all all this stuff was only just recently possible, though, right? I mean, like when you talk about edge compute, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I like to think that this is something that ARM is really enabling, right? I mean, we're we're trying to enable this whole edge compute area. Compute is increasing like exponentially. And yeah. so, you know, look back 10 years ago and you say, oh, well, we want to put this, you know, server system on site. We want it to do all this ML AI stuff for you uh, in your factories, at your home. People would have been like, that's oh, not possible right now. But I mean, you know, fast yeah. forward 2020, here we are talking about it. And I mean, I don't know. Do you have any like input on that? I just think that it's an amazing thing to think about. It, it's moving so quick. <laughs> it's moving really, really quick. Uh, you know, even a couple of years ago, just bringing AI models on beefy devices was a challenge. Um, and, you know, even the hardware, like you said, you know, ARM is really innovating there. And, you know, it's, it was a long time of, of people not being able to get access to devices or, you know, the devices weren't able to do the compute um, and the processing fast enough, or was it right for the scenario? I mean, it's the amount of uh, tech that has happened to enable running these uh, ML, running ML on the edge has increased in the last couple of years. And the fact that I can now, you know, have the Raspberry Pi 4, which is a little bit more beefier, but uh, also have the Jetsa Nano um, going ahead and it's, you know, a $99 board, but I can run AI models on that that particular board. Uh, the that new one's 59. That, yeah, yeah. The new one, the two gigs is only 59 now. They have that new that one. Isn't that crazy? You know, yeah. it kind of, it kind of reminds me of, you know, when what the, it's not directly a uh, comparison, but uh, when Wi-Fi, when I used to work at SparkFun, Wi-Fi was so expensive. Like the, uh, just having a Wi-Fi module uh, was just ridiculous. It was like, we're charging $40 for this module. And now you can get, you know, uh, work with uh, ex uh, like a ESP32 or 8266 and they're like $5 or even cheaper. Um, and so the fact that, you know, the accessibility 
to these devices for more people to play with and innovate with is just increased, uh, which is exciting. And even on the cloud side, so for Microsoft's story, we didn't have Azure IoT Edge, you know, uh, uh, four years ago, uh, three years ago. And when we did have IoT Edge, uh, which is for those who are not familiar, we do have an offering called Azure IoT Edge. It's it's um, it's based off of Mobi. Uh, so think of it as being able to take containers uh, from the cloud, deploy it uh, to this runtime called IoT Edge on the device side. And it helps um, to be able to kind of manage these, these containers. Uh, and I, I'll talk about that later at the demo. Uh, but even with that, we didn't have a way to store the data. Um, we just we're just trying to figure out how we could deploy these AI models on the edge. Um, and so everything's still really kind of fresh and new, it still feels like. Um, and we were just having a conversation just about having big devices. And now the fact we're even talking about microcontrollers is just blowing my mind. Uh, so it's moving quickly, which is exciting. Yeah. Awesome. I think, um, you know, you mentioned the demo a couple of times. I'm really excited about, about yeah. the demo. But before diving into that, I've got another couple of questions. Yeah. Um, so one is actually, you know, you've got a special position because you're in this world. I mean, you're at Microsoft, right? Like, I, you know, I always think of Microsoft as a great company. Uh, I remember it's one of the probably the first tech companies I've heard of when I was a kid, right? Like it's it's always been there. And uh, so you, you're, in, you're at the center of a big ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, and you probably talked to a lot of developers, I imagine, given your job. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I, the question is really about, like, what kind of challenges are you seeing in the developer space uh, that, you know, you're trying to address or, you know, you, Microsoft is trying to address as a whole? Yeah, you know, I think one, this is a, a huge challenge that we have as a skills gap. Um, and with the skills gap, especially in the IoT space, it's it's because there's so many devices that are being unlocked every minute, and it's just going to get even more intense. And so there's only so many developers uh, that uh, uh, that uh, know IoT, and so we're trying to do a lot when it comes to training developers, but also make technology easier uh, and simplify building. Uh, devices and building machine learning, you know, if you're wanting to do intelligent edge, uh, making it easier. Uh, so for example, uh, we have a service called Cognitive Services. Uh, and it's a line of all of these uh, uh, services that came from Microsoft Research and different teams uh, where, you know, we've been running AI on the cloud for a really long time. Um, and so we wanted to be able to make it easy and accessible for folks. Uh, so if let's say as an embedded developer, if I wanted to you know, do object detection or, or uh, custom vision or anything like that, uh, I can now work with cognitive services that used to be just in the cloud, now actually deploy that on the edge device um, and easily make a model train a model and get it on the device with no background and AI, which to me is huge. Um, and then uh, we have services like Azure Machine Learning, where you know if you do have a background in AI, it's really, really beneficial um, to be able to use Azure Machine Learning to help deploy on devices uh, and make your custom modules. So we're just trying to simplify that experience for folks, knowing that there is a huge skills gap, um, knowing that if you have, like I've coded with a lot of partners and customers, and one thing I keep seeing is that you have these teams who work on the device side, embedded developers, they know in and out of the devices, and then you have your AI experts, and they have never talked to each other before. And so when you bring them together, they have different languages that they use, they have different preferred tooling. Um, so when you bring them together, we wanted to make sure that the tooling that we had supported all of these different developer types. So if you're comfortable in Python, uh, you should be able to build uh, you know, a model in Python. Um, if you're comfortable in C uh, and that's your, your preferred language, we have uh, support for C. Uh, so there's, it's, it's marrying these, uh, these communities together and having a simplified uh, experience for if, wherever you come in uh, for building an IoT solution. You, you know, a lot of this makes me think of like, uh, 
the barrier to entry for AI ML, right? I mean, in a way, providing all these tools, making things so simple. I mean, looking back at when we had the open MV call, right? You get this IDE, you pull it up, you just hit a button a few times with a camera pointed at something and it just learns it for you. <clears throat> Part of me wants to look at the, at the negative impact this may have uh, because, you know, fast forward 10, 20 years, it's not like the person who wrote this software is teaching his or her kid to write that software. It's not like something that's, you know, passed down along the bloodlines. It's, it's, it has to, you know, spark in someone to want to go learn this. And so if we're creating all this software and all these tools for people to utilize, will eventually we get to a point, and this happened in like power systems, right? Like electrical engineering, people who were in power systems, eventually the people who developed all these early power systems got old and there was no one to replace them. And so there was a huge deficit for people who, did power systems. Are we going to see this AI ML deficit 20 years from now when the people who develop these tools are retiring and yet the people who utilize them only ever knew the simple way of doing things? And I see this at hackathons too, right? Where like students are now detached from command line. All they use are these big clunky IDEs. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I mean, like I, you just made me think of that. I thought I'd bring it up, but... It's, it's uh, you know, I've, I've heard that many times before and I have that question myself at times. Um, I, I think I've had this conversation a lot with, um, uh, kind of related with, uh, uh, my background is mostly in C. Uh, and so, uh, you know, working with microcontrollers, now there's a big push to bring Python and, uh, you know, uh, with microcontrollers. Um, but I think, Knowing what you're what you're saying, uh, when I think about the technology where we're at right now, um, I think it's super important that we're teaching folks the concepts, that we're empowering folks to get started quickly. Um, you know, I I can't help to think. Um, so I'm part of this V team called Project 15 at Microsoft. Uh, we're all about bringing conservationists and researchers. Uh, and um, uh, developers together to build these these amazing projects uh, for conservation, um, and they're based on IoT. Um, and when we worked with all of these projects, we realized eighty percent of the code was the same. Uh, and so we built eighty percent of the code for them, so they could just take that. But there's always that last twenty percent uh, that you need to be an expert in that particular area to finish that last 20%. So I think there's always going to be a need for, you know, AI experts uh, in these different scenarios and keep innovating in this area. And in order for us to keep innovating in this area, people are going to need to get the foundations or, you know, need able to, to continue to learn about machine learning or hopefully, hopefully the command line, hopefully, <laughs> I don't know, I start... <laughs> on notepad <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but uh i yeah I, it's an interesting i don't know it yeah. I, I had 10 I, million I, I things agree. to say with that but i had to cut it short but yeah <laughs> it's, it's 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 a good it's a good thing to think about no i agree i think i think uh you know the, the, the way i see it or i i like to think about it is we we're trying to you know the work we're doing together is to try and enable the millions to actually, you know, deploy yeah. stuff that could be useful, right? And we're trying to help people that might not have the skills in electronics, in uh, computer mm -hmm. science, uh, because we, you know, I believe that, for example, you brought up conservationists, um, that there are people out there that need help to do mm -hmm. build technology uh, for th their use cases, that, and they might not have the yeah the skill set or even the the knowledge that even exactly. if they might not even then might not even be aware that it's possible right mm -hmm. and we, we we have to unlock the the opportunities for all these people at the same time though i agree with you there are always going to be the specialists that are going to be able to like mm -hmm. dig into that thing right because at the end of the day um you know those are always going to be needed it's just that there isn't enough for them right and i think we exactly. need more people with either those skills or uh, more tools to actually enable more people right so i think yeah i like to think that these two worlds coexist they're not one or the other right a hundred percent. That's a hundred percent what I was trying to say. And, and I, I tried to do it in five minutes. You did it in 30 seconds. Yes. <laughs> no, I was just going off what you said. So you, know, you made me think of that, but uh, no, that, I appreciate that. So mm -hmm. uh, we talked about a lot about, you know, skill deficit and the fact that there is a need mm -hmm. for tools. And I think, you know, there are a lot of things that Microsoft are doing well. And one of that is actually uh, 
the ability, the tools to actually uh, enable developers to get started quickly and and you know and, and move quickly. So I know you've got a demo ready. Uh, so I'm curious if yeah. we should, should we do that now so that you can talk through perhaps the the, the various steps and how you what what you're enabling people to do. Is yes, I, I would love to love to jump into the demo. Um, so uh, the demo that I'm going to be showing today is really all about uh, how to create your own classifier uh, and how you could do that with uh, custom vision. Um, and you know, if if you are super uh, into AI or even on the device side, uh, show how we can simplify that experience and then bring uh, bring it to a device. Uh, it could be a device like the Raspberry Pi. Oh, I can't, I, <laughs> I haven't connected to Ethernet. <laughs> so I couldn't bring it over. Um, or, you know, a Jetson Nano device. Um, and so let me go ahead and I'm gonna share my, share my screen. I want to I want to remind everyone who's watching uh, that any resources that are shared or things that are posted here that that Pamela may talk about, uh, we're going to do our best to get all of that stuff to posted in the description. So if you're watching this later on and and you want to go recreate or check out more stuff that Pamela was was working on or showcasing, mm -hmm. just check out the description below. Yeah, we you know when we were talking earlier about. Uh, what was happening in the intelligent edge space. Uh, I have this kind of diagram that showcases we have all of these different types of devices and how, you know, we're now starting to get a little bit more support when it comes to, you know, MCUs uh, for ML on the edge. But for my demo today, uh, can we share your screen? Is that okay? We oh, share your screen? Now? Yes. Okay. There we go. All right. I'm going to, Go back to a couple slides. Just <laughs> <laughs> so, so, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so this is this was kind of just us chatting earlier about, you know, you have all of these different workloads on the cloud, now going to edge devices, going to MCUs, but really uh, I the amount of times I've been asked uh, which device to choose, uh, I, you know, I wish I got a nickel every time, uh, but What's great about this, it just shows that, you know, there is support when it comes to these microcontrollers um, for ML on the edge um, and then ML on the cloud side too. And then I have a slide for the edge story, which I'll, I'll uh, share those links with everyone. But we talked about earlier about edge impulse, uh, TensorFlow Lite on MCUs, uh, but we have an offering uh, called Azure IoT Edge uh, that can sit on a Raspberry Pi. So you've got Raspberry Pi 4, or you got a Jetson Nano device. Uh, you can actually use Azure IoT Edge. Uh, so the demo I'm just going to be showcasing is a mass um, a mass detection demo. It's really a classifier. Uh, and so whenever I put on a mask, it's going to identify that I have a mask on. And when I remove the mask, I will identify that I don't have a mask on. And so I'm just going to showcase kind of an architecture of how IoT Edge works first. And then I'll jump into uh, showcasing how you can make a classifier quickly. Uh, so we have this product called Azure IoT Hub. Think of it as a bi-directional cloud gateway. So when you're sending data, your sensors to the cloud, we actually have a cloud gateway and this is the, the service. Um, but when you think of building ML on the edge, uh, we like to use IoT Edge uh, different containers. And each one of these containers, think of them as hosting a piece of code. Uh, so we have a custom piece of code. Today, I'm going to be using Azure Cognitive Services. And so we build on the cloud side these machine learning um, uh, or AI or machine learning models on the cloud side and different containers. And then I'm going to move those containers up to the cloud. And really what I'm doing here is just storing these containers. And I'm going to explain in a moment why we're, we're doing that. But think of these as their own little applications. So for this particular demo, I'm going to be using uh, custom vision. Uh, this little piece of code is going to tell me if I'm wearing a mask or not. I'm going to have that container, uh, which is that piece of code sitting in a container registry. And then I'm going to go ahead and deploy this little manifest 
to our edge device, which is a Raspberry Pi. Uh, this manifest is going to tell me which containers and which version of these containers to deploy on the edge. And then I'm going to go ahead and deploy the modules on the edge. Uh, so there, I always get the question of why do you want to have do your models on the cloud or host your models on the cloud? Uh, and the reason for that is because let's say you have thousands of these devices uh, and you want to be able to deploy different containers uh, to those devices or the same container to all of the devices, it makes it easy. So you're just managing these different device uh, containers. Also, what's nice about having a little piece of code on a container is that I can have a image classifier container uh, ready to go to deploy on one device. I can also have an object detection container uh, that works together uh, that all deploys on the device. So it's just a nice way to manage uh, your, your uh, version and do version control of containers and your ML models. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and just jump in because I know we're limited on time. And if you're ever interested in learning more, I can uh, share some links links to you. All right, so this is Custom Vision. Custom Vision is uh, a really, really nice, nice service that we have here at Microsoft. Uh, it allows you to, you know, uh, deploy uh, image classifiers to device in containers. Um, so you're able to go ahead and create your, your, your model, um, train your model, and then deploy your model. Uh, so it's just a, it's a really nice service. Uh, so I have a model or uh, one that I'm building right now, a project. And you can see that I have a bunch of different images. Uh, anytime that you're building a model, uh, you're going to want to have tons of images to, to uh, go ahead and reference to and tag. So I'm going to and train with. So I'm going to go ahead, add a couple images. You're adding these now? Oh, oh, you're not taking the images. You're just adding them from like a yeah, file. Yeah, I'm right? adding them from a file. So I'm going to go ahead, upload the two files. And I can go to this image and see, okay, I am wearing a mask. So I'm gonna go ahead and select and tag. So you're gonna take a lot of these images and you're gonna tag them. And that's going to help uh, when you're training your classifiers. So I am a person wearing my protective gear. I'm gonna save. And then I'm gonna go ahead and tag that I am not wearing my mask. I'm gonna save and close. And you can see it's added it to my, my collection of images that I'm gonna soon train. Um, I've already trained these images already, but whenever you're building with custom vision or anytime you're trying to build an AI model and classifier, having tons of images from different angles, lighting, uh, uh, different environments really helps when you're trying to train uh, the image. So, Next, I'm going to go ahead and export and uh, download uh, this model, put it in the Azure Container Registry, which is going to host my model, and then deploy it on my Raspberry Pi device. I, and I'm just going to show the code real quick. So as I talked about before, you have those different modules that host a little bit of those applications. So I actually have a model here that uh, actually is the code itself on, um, on, on the classifier side. And you can see I have all these different system modules for running with Azure IoT Edge, and they all, you know, uh, uh, it shows which modules to deploy on the device side and how they work together. So I'm going to go ahead. I've already done that. And I had to, unfortunately, I like to do demos live. I had to do a video instead, uh, just because my internet's not running great. Uh, but here's a video of the image 
uh, classifier is actually on my device right now. And because it's in a container, I could deploy it on a Raspberry Pi that's running the IoT Edge runtime, or I could deploy it on a Nano device. It's, it's, it's up to you, any, any device that uh, can run IoT Edge. And so you could see that the, here's the tag that I was tagging before, put my mask on. You can <clears throat> see that I got shows, shows that my mask is on. And then when I take it off, it's going to say, I'm not wearing a mask. And so you could continue to add images to train the model better. And you could see right here, it says person not wearing PPE is because I had my hand there. Um, and so if you want it to, you could actually add more images and tag it uh, appropriately to say, oh, you're wearing your mask or you're adjusting your mask. Uh, so that's one way that you could continue to approve prove your, your model. But yeah, that's I just real quick just wanted to to showcase that that demo. Uh, so I'm gonna stop stop sharing. This is this is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> We've got a question from Carlo. Actually, I think that's relevant. Um, given that you know yeah. we run through this quickly, I'm, I'm aware that there's so much more to talk about, right? Uh, so Carlo is asking, do you know if there will be any good relevant talks helpful for IoT devs at GitHub Universe? Um, I mean, I guess I, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but I guess the wider question is, um, you're going to share resources yes. on on all this, right? Uh, so we can, yeah, so we can share uh, a bunch of resources, and perhaps like if there is any uh, kind of upcoming talks or things that you want us to to share as well with the community, we could do that as well. Um, anything that you know of that's kind of relevant to? Yeah, you know, space. I did a. a uh, we have multiple talks. I did a two hour talk that actually talks about deep dives into ML on the edge. Cause I know it's a hard, it's a topic that's hard to cover in just like a couple of minutes. Uh, so if you're interested, I'll go ahead and link, uh, up, um, on the chat. And then also we do have a full, uh, learning path. Uh, if you're interested in intelligent edge on Microsoft learn, uh, which is what's great about that is that it's in a sandbox environment. Uh, so we do have tons of tutorials. I think we're at 40 plus tutorials that's in a sandbox environment. So you don't have to create an Azure account. You could just go ahead and start playing. We even have one with a raspberry Pi, uh, uh, with a Pi simulator, or you could use your real, uh, Pi. And so I'll go ahead and link those below. And okay, uh, while you do that, real quick, right, I just right. want to point out, like, while you were giving your presentation, we got some really nice comments there. You know, uh, Sar says, great, great overview of the edge to cloud hardware. And then Peter also commented that the whole Microsoft IoT team is really great, to be honest. So, um, you know. Awesome. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. And I, I didn't catch the other name. I'm sorry. Sar, right. right, there you oh, go. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Short amount of time, but we'll send a bunch of resources so you guys can geek out on it. Yeah, and we'll we'll put all the resources below on the video as well after the mm -hmm. after this. So yeah, you will have them there. Um, okay, so I mean that was awesome, uh, but actually, you know, I wanted to actually bring in our other guest because we've got another guest, right? Uh, another special guest from Microsoft. So I'm really excited to bring in Jen Fox, Senior Program Manager. Hi, Jen. Hello. Hey, hey, everybody. Thanks so much for Hello. having me. And this was super fun to watch. Where's Where's yeah. your bug? Oh, <laughs> yeah, oh, that's that's a nice cool. one. Mm, Thank you. Is it, is it? I feel like there would be some mead in there, not coffee. <laughs> oh, it is too early for that. It is <laughs> But yeah. this is my favorite mug. I got it at the um, volcano in Hawaii. Oh, very nice. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so, so much. Think, it's such a good discussion. I'm really stoked to jump in. Awesome. Yeah, it's awesome to have you. And I think um, you know it's uh, it's also to have you. I wish we brought you in earlier, um, but you know we've got we've got a bunch of time to actually talk a lot about a lot of other interesting things here. And uh, I'm really you know the first thing I'll start with. I mean, is obviously let you uh, give you know introduce yourself, and then I've got a really interesting question for both of you actually. But yeah, you 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 do that. You introduce yourself first because we haven't cool. we want to know who you are and what you do actually. Yeah, what does senior right. program manager at Microsoft do. <laughs> Who, what, how did I end up here? This is wild. Um, yeah, so like you mentioned, uh, my name is Jen, and I'm a senior program manager for a team called Make It at Microsoft. We are a um, a small team exploring strategies for engaging makers. 
So prior to this gig, I actually ran a, um, an arts-based STEM education company. Um, I say arts-based, it's really kind of maker education-based, but not everybody knows that term. Um, and I have been a maker for a number of years under the handle Jen Foxbot. Jen Fox is a very common name, so I had to get creative. That one stuck and I very much enjoy it. Um, so through both of these jobs, I'm really driven to make technology and STEM subjects in general more accessible for a wide variety of folks. And so, you know, to kind of tap into the discussion that y'all were having earlier, I love that you call out that, you know, ML on the edge, um, technology, IoT, these types of things are really just tools. They, you know, if, if you wanna learn these types of tools, you totally can do that on your own without a degree. I'm a huge proponent of learning by doing. Um, and also, you know, if you wanna learn these tools to do other types of things, that's great too. I've taught a lot of, you know, musicians how to build their own instruments or how to build custom effects pedals. I've worked with a lot of different fantastic artists in incorporating electronic sensors into their types of projects and doing some, you know, VR type of stuff. And it's just, it's, it's really a tool to add to your bag of tricks. So whatever you wanna do, whatever you're passionate about, the more tools that we have at our disposal, the more things that we can make, the more problems we can solve and the better that we can do them. And, and the other thing too is, you know, most of us walk around with the computer in our pockets and a lot of us don't really understand how it works. Um, and so I think it's really important as we're moving forward as a society to improve our educational system, to start talking about technology, to start working with it, to understand, you know, how does it work? How does it not work? What's it capable of? What can it not do? And to just understand like, what are these devices doing and how can I modify them to fit my own needs? So yeah, that was a little plug on education because I'm very passionate. Um, <laughs> to go back to our team, um, probably should talk about that a little bit more. Um, I'm really excited to be at Microsoft because Microsoft has a lot of super cool technology and our team is really focusing on making that technology more accessible for makers of all types. Um, so some of the things that we are creating include documentation, sample code, um, uh, example projects and walkthroughs, which I'll show you in a little bit, um, and end-to-end -end guides focusing on the maker audience and really, you know, being clear about um, cost transparency, what skills you need to build these, and what can you actually do with these tools. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I, you know, I, I had um, this question in mind before you started introducing yourself because I, I'm really, you know, I think we're bringing in uh, – two awesome spaces here, right? Like we're talking about ML on the edge and IoT, but I think there is um, a question that I've got, that I've, I've got, um, you know, I've had in mind for the last couple of years, and I'm really curious to take your uh, your view on this. So we had, um, we had, you know, this big movement, this big maker movement, right, for many years, and there was a lot of investment from big companies. And then that kind of, you know, stopped, or, or I shouldn't say stopped, changed, right? I think the maker movement changed somehow. Um, and, you know, I've got my view on, on how it changed and I don't think it disappeared, right? I think it just shifted mm -hmm. to something else. So I'd like to hear your view on or both of you, actually, because I know, you know, Pamela, you were at, um, also at SparkFun earlier. So I, I'd like to hear your views on what you, what you think about the maker movement and how it evolved today. Yeah, totally. So, you know, makers are very active. Um, they have not gone away. Um, I think that there are a lot of hard conversations with, you know, some of the some of the bankruptcies that we've seen across the community, which are really tragic. Um, I'm in Seattle and Seattle in particular has struggled with maintaining a, um, a public facing makerspace, which like has been really frustrating because I'm super passionate about makerspaces um, as, you know, really imperative as a community resource. So there are a lot of challenges within the community, but that said, the individuals are super resilient, really motivated, and we saw that in the be during the pandemic when you know the U.S. kind of had this stark realization that we don't really have a lot of manufacturing in house anymore. Um, we've exported that, and that's okay. But when things like this happen, we have we have to ha grapple with these hard questions. And makers really stood up and said, "We need PPE. How can I help?" I have a 3D printer. I can't make a lot, but I can I can make a difference. Um, you had a lot of people, you know, tackling mask making. And one of the things I love about makers is it's like, 
what problems do I care about being solved and how do I learn the skills to solve those things? And so makers are really, you know, they're in the trenches, they're doing these things, they still exist. And from my perspective, I think it's really imperative that we just make it easier for them to do what they're doing. A hundred percent. Makers definitely haven't gone away. I think there's some renaming of uh, some people don't call themselves makers and that whole conversation. Um, but I, I think the core of uh, makers is still there, right? Uh, as, as Jen mentioned. And I think maybe uh, what you're kind of hinting on is that it had a big moment where all of these uh, big partners were coming and talking about makers and, and everything else. And I even saw that when I was in Spark Fun, you know, we, we were in our own little community and then everyone was like, what is this maker? What is this maker community? We need to know more about this maker community. And then starting to kind of like, how can we make money out of the maker community and stuff? And I was, as a Spark coming from a, a maker company, that's what I was seeing at that time of, of it blowing up and um, people taking more note of what was happening in the maker space. Uh, but, you know, as Jen mentioned that we're still here, uh, people are always going to want to build and super interested in, um, you know, all of the new tools that are coming on for makers and it's more accessible now. Uh, you're seeing in, in schools, uh, STEM, you know, makers, it's, it's a huge thing. Um, and so it's continuing to grow, I think. Um, and so I, I, I like to think we're still here. There's still a huge big play on there. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited, excited. I don't think it's gone away. Uh, as you can tell, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, people in this, this uh, stream who are, you know, coding and making at this moment. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to say it's still here. <laughs> so. Can I, can I add to this, Alessandra? Is that okay? So, so I love everything both of you just said. I, I just wanted to add a little bit to this. I mean, I kind of feel like, and this is just something I noticed because I used to go to the maker fairs in San Francisco. Yep, I don't know. I if you had the yep. Those stopped, right? And you kind of saw this, like Alessandra mentioned, this this kind of downturn of of the labeling of maker, I guess you could call it. <laughs> and I, at least this is my two cents. I kind of feel that corporate companies started this stigma that makers equal not professional. And That's, yes, and that yeah. like that for some reason it kind of tarnished it. And I don't want to blame the maker fair because I love the maker fair, right? But in some ways, the Maker Fair was taking money from these corporate companies. And then, you know, you have a bunch of kids coming by and checking stuff out. And it's not necessarily the professional setting, right? So, I mean, like maybe the expectation was different. I don't know, right? But the way I look at makers is that this is the side thing that a lot of people do. They are the professionals. They're in the technical community. And they're doing this maker stuff on the side for fun. Now, of course, there's makers who just do it for fun and they're maybe kids or they're mm -hmm. entertaining all these cool things, but I, I don't know. That's just like my two cents on it. I kind of feel that maybe they just got mistakenly labeled and then it just, the, the echo chamber took over. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that. Right. Uh, I, I totally know what you're saying, Robert. Uh, so I think in that, in that area, um, and, and I, you know, remind folks uh, about this is that, you know, when people say, should we have samples with Raspberry Pi? And it's like, yes, you should, because as you pointed out, Robert, you know, a lot of embedded developers in their day job, they'll have like a pie on their desk, you know, because people want to rapidly prototype. They want to play with this right away. Does it mean that certain devices um, you'll be able to go to production. Uh, that's a that's a, a totally different store, you know, conversation that we'll have to we'll have to come back and talk about. Um, but uh, I think that if people just keep in mind that people are going to continue hacking and you know they do it in their day jobs and they are makers on the nights and weekends. But uh, there is there is value into, into working in this community and uh, professionals are using these dev boards and breakout boards and pies to, to, to geek out on. And I, I, I wanna add to, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I, well, I believe, and also there's a lot of research, research to support this, but yeah. the best way to learn is to do. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's really what being a maker is about, is saying like, 
I want to build this project or I want to learn this skill. And to do that, I am going to cobble together a variety of different resources to be able to achieve the outcome that I want to achieve. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think labels are hard, right? Um, I'm not a huge fan of labels. Um, they are kind of critical because like the world's very complex and at a certain point, like you kind of have to put yourself into some bins. Um, not not a fan of pigeonholing, but I, I do think that the maker label is very broad and I like to use it as a very broad term. Um, so things like STEM, like, yes, I believe STEM is very important as I mentioned earlier, but I also believe that every subject is important. And that's why I really was drawn to the maker community because it's saying like, you know, at Maker Fair you have people that are building their own robots and you also have tapegami. And so that's what I love about the community and what I think is really important to recognize from, you know, from kind of this like corporate perspective is just like makers are very different. Some people don't necessarily identify it anymore because it did kind of get co-opted in some senses, like the whole like greed movement. Um, so we want to try very hard to avoid doing that to makers because it is a really important segment of our population. And, you know, we want to respect artist makers, tech makers, um, artisans, and the whole spectrum of folks that might identify with this category. Exactly. Completely, yeah. completely agree. I think, so I, I come, my background, and then, I, and then I'll stop on this, but it's a really interesting point. My background is physics, right? So I, I see a maker as a, you too. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So I see a maker, to me, a maker. Yeah. yeah. To me, a maker is a researcher, right? It's someone that's <laughs> trying to explore the world with the tools they have, right? And if they've got a Raspberry Pi, they try with that. If they've mm -hmm. got something else, they try with something else. But it's it's what's most available and what's you know at hand. Uh, and you know, that's up to us to make the tools and the and the hardware platforms easier to use so that more people can use them, right? And that goes back mm -hmm. to the conversation we had earlier, Pamela. Um, but you know, to me, it's uh, it's just a bunch of people exploring the world, right? And yeah. uh, there's so much technology out there that you know it's it's awesome that. You know, there's so much things that you can do nowadays that maybe a few years ago you weren't able to do, right? And and actually, to that point, I think we we run out of time. I, I gotta say, <laughs> we got oh. carried away with uh, with really cool conversations, um, really interesting uh, topics. But Jen, I'd like to you've got a demo, so maybe you know, there's a couple of points that we wanted to talk about uh, ML on the edge uh, when it comes to makers. But perhaps you can talk about that while you're doing the demo. What do you think? Yeah, um, totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll see. Um, and then, I, and then we could bring out. You know, we could we could stay a couple of minutes longer. I think you know I'm open. Uh, so I think Robert <laughs> is as well. So yeah, I'm excited to see what you got. So Sweet. let's let's bring it up, oh. and then we can we can chat more. Yeah, totally. So I will start by sharing my screen. And um, apologies in advance. Um, I am new to Streamyard, and so we're gonna see how this goes. Okay. <laughs> What, am I sharing my screen? Yes. So. Yes, um, you are. Cool. Thank you for the audio cue. Um, so one of the things that our team has started to focus on um, is machine learning because, you know, we believe that it has a ton of potential to help folks make lots of different types of cool, useful, and helpful projects um, with machine learning especially if it's easier to get started. You know, um, I'm a maker, um, other people on our team are makers. We are talking to a lot of different makers and kind of asking, you know, like, what, what are the barriers to entry? And a lot of what Pamela mentioned is what folks are lamenting, right? Like, there's just a lack of documentation. The documentation that's out there can be really challenging to get started. Um, and so we're really aiming to work um, work with various teams within Microsoft and also externally to Microsoft to make these types of tools easier. And so I'm really excited to show um, a program called Loeb, which was a team that we got connected with very early on um, when, our, when our team started. Um, so mind you, this is a very old version of Loeb when I was testing it out prior to going public. Um, but I wanted to show this to you because this is um, the machine learning model that I built for my Raspberry Pi trash classifier. Um, so one of the things that has always been challenging for me is like, where does this piece of trash go? Is it compost, garbage, recycling, hazardous waste? What do I do with it? Um, and you know, so I am really stoked that Seattle compost, but sometimes it's it's hard to know what I can compost. And so what Loeb allows you to do, kind of very similar to what Custom Vision allows you to do on Azure is um, you can either take images with your webcam 
or you can port them in um, in labeled folders. And so I did a little bit of both to build this model. So you will see here, um, these are images that I took on this computer. Um, so just like Pamela did, this is a piece of kale that went bad. So I took a lot of different photos of it that, um, you know, at different angles, different hand positions, different distances, some that were a little bit blurry, some were super close up. The more types of photos that you can get, the more accurate the model is going to be at recognizing that particular object um, or classifying that image, I should say. But then, you know, I was kind of on a deadline with this project. I spent maybe about a month taking my own photos and I got like 900 photos, but it's super time consuming. I'm not, I didn't have everything that I needed. So I ended up going online and finding an open source data set on a website called Kaggle, K-A-G-G-L-E. And so that's what these images are here, the ones with a different background, I'm assuming a table. And so this helped me, it had maybe a thousand images. I had to relabel some of the folders, but it was way faster and just, allowed me to make my model a little bit more robust. Um, and so over here on the left side, you can see that these are the different categories. And one of the things I love about Loeb is that it tells you which categories are doing well. So for example, compost, it's like, um, you need more photos. This isn't very accurate. Versus recycling, which is like, all right, you're pretty good to go. This has a lot of good photos. Um, so you can see in real time you know, where you need to add more um, more photos and what's doing pretty well. Um, then you can also see uh, the results. If, it, if the model is training, it'll say training here. And you can also, um, I can't do this right now because I'm sharing my webcam, but when you click play, you can test the model in real time. And so it'll use your webcam, you can hold up an image and it'll put, um, it'll do the image classification and you can test if it's accurate or not. If it gets it wrong, you can relabel the image and help improve the model um, along the way. So that is really, really cool. Um, oh, and then the one thing that I also wanted to mention too was that um, I worked with the Loeb folks and originally I had classified myself as compost, which is a little on the nose. Um, I thought it was kind of cheeky and funny, but then I realized wait, if I'm not holding anything or if I'm taking a picture and it doesn't quite get the object in the, in the um, image, what is it gonna classify it as? Well, it's gonna tell me it's compost and that's not great. So I ended up um, making a not trash category based on the recommendation of the Loeb folks, which basically, as you'll see, is just images of the background of my face. And at some point I started taking pictures of my hand without anything in it so that the model would recognize that just because my hand is in a particular position holding an object, like bottle caps I noticed would recognize as, as uh, garbage, even if I wasn't holding anything. Um, and so this allows me to create a category that's kind of this, uh, the model didn't recognize an object, we're gonna put it in the not trash category. And lastly, you can also export your model. Again, this is an old version. So now there is a TensorFlow Lite option, which is what I would recommend um, for doing edge devices. But you can export your model in different types of formats to build an app, to put it on the edge. Um, and yeah, it's super, super cool. OK, so now, um, do we have a few more minutes? Are we doing OK? Uh, yeah, we've already let the let let our viewers know that we're going to go a little over. So yeah, thanks for sticking around. And if you have to leave, yes. please go ahead. Mm -hmm. if, if the viewers have to leave, please go ahead, and you can tune back in. This goes live. You know, it'll be available very very shortly after the live stream. You can just watch that last part later. Yeah. Sweet, cool. I'm going to yeah. keep keep going. Interrupt me yeah. if you if you need to ask a question or do whatever. Because like I get really excited about my projects. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is the actual box. Um, we'll see if I can get the angle right. Um, so full disclosure, I did end up pulling out the Raspberry Pi from this project to do another project, but this is still the, the electronics are still inside. It's a little bit messy. Uh, my wire management has improved over time, but still a little messy. Um, so I made a cardboard box. I spray painted it because it's cute. Um, sometimes that's the only reason we need. Um, but I want to really quickly point out the features of the box um, in a little bit more close up view and then I'll do the demo. Um, so uh, this is the status light, which tells you if the device is ready. It will pulse slowly when it's um, when it's on and ready to go. Uh, I thought I was choosing a soft white LED, but it turns out it was RGB. Whoopsies, but that's okay. <laughs> I thought it was kind of cute. Um, and then you use the push button to take a picture, um, kind of like a photo booth. 
And then this is the camera right here. And so when you push the push button, the Pi Foundation recommends letting the camera focus for about two seconds. So while that's happening, this will blink faster to let you know that it's focusing. When it actually takes the picture, it turns off, the status light turns off. It takes about one to two seconds to classify the image. Um, I was using the full TensorFlow version for this, so TF light will go way faster. Um, and then these indicator lights, one of them will light up to tell you where the piece of trash goes. Yellow for garbage, blue for recycling, green for compost, and red for hazardous waste. So this is my little box. And like Pamela, I also have a video demo, which I will pull up right now. Do, 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 do. Cool. And then I'm going to talk over this. Let's see if full screen sharing works. OK, cool. So in this demo, I am testing a plastic bag. And ideally, it should be classified as garbage. Um, so one of the things that I thought was really cool about the load model is that plastic bags are really hard to class to get enough images um because you know they're they're kind of this like amorphous shape every time i hold up a plastic bag it's going to be in a different shape um and there are lots of different types of plastic bags too so i was really stoked when i took a picture of the plastic bag um and i wanted to make sure that it classified it as garbage um so you saw the the status light blink a little faster. It turns off because it's taking the picture. Oh, boom! Garbage! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> really excited that my public actually works. It always feels a little bit like magic. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, good time. Um, so yeah, as I'm as I'm kind of talking about in the video, it's a lot easier to do this to just take a picture um, than it is to look at that pamphlet. And then this is the one where I'm testing the not trash category. So I'm taking a picture of my face. I have to get really close to the camera. And ideally, it's not going to light anything up. And as you see, none of the indicator lights turn on, and the status light just turns back on in its fabulous RGB format. Yeah. Cool. All right. Awesome. I, I think I've got a surprise for both of you. So we've got we've got an expert on the call for maybe a couple of minutes. So uh, before we close. He might have a couple of ML questions for you guys. So let's bring, let's bring <laughs> the expert in. Uh -oh. and oh, it's expert it's been, time. <laughs> you've been lurking. <laughs> I know. This is how I sit and judge in my <laughs> position of expertise. You're judging. Over here. In my You're dungeon. Yeah. <laughs> judging us over there. Yep. Yeah. No, no, no. This was so good. I actually just found out about Loeb two weeks ago. So that just shows you how much of an expert I am and that I was like, oh, this is a new great thing. But it obviously, just go public, so. oh, that's what it is. Oh, it's so good. I love seeing this. Um, also, by the way, since you brought it up, uh, if it does export TensorFlow light models, we're releasing an Arm and N pip install version in the next few weeks. So that'll make it run even faster on a Raspberry Pi. I'm still working out the details myself, but stay tuned for Arm ML <laughs> news. But yeah, we're That's we're exciting. always working on making that whole deployment thing easier and faster. <laughs> um, yeah, so questions, questions. I have some questions in terms of if you are developing these things in the cloud and running it in a container on a device, what are the differences between the cloud version and then the container version? Are there things you're sacrificing? Are you losing anything? Uh, both in terms of like, how does that work with the Microsoft, uh, it's co Cognito, right? Or yes, um, the Microsoft one and then the cloud version, like how does that work? Yeah, uh, uh, Jen, did you, is it okay if I just jump in? Yeah, uh, okay. Okay. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> uh, So, uh, Carl, was it Cognitive Services? Or Cognitive was Services, it? yes, okay, that perfect. one. <laughs> yeah, uh, what's the difference between the services version and then the local version? So, uh, Cognitive Services, yeah, there, there, is a, there is a difference between um, uh, when you deploy a model on a device, um, and some of the models you can have on the cloud side, because when you're on a device, uh, you know there's some limitations of what you could do on that device side versus the cloud. You can, you know, you could do a lot more. Um, and so, not all of our cognitive services actually you you can't uh, deploy it on the device. Uh, so we have, I think we, oh, don't quote me. Um, I think we have about six 
six, five or six of those services uh, um, that are able to, to be deployed on the on the device side. The cloud um, version of it is exactly the same as the uh, uh, version on the device side. Uh, so when you're hosting it in Azure Container Registry or if it's a Docker Hub or wherever you want to host this container, um, it's, it's, it's the same. Uh, so it just depends on if you're using those custom vision module, uh, 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 service, uh, cog services, uh, and deploying it on the, on the device side or not. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I think that was my question. That was, that's <laughs> like, there's always limitations when there's a huge difference between the power in the cloud and the power on the edge. And that's getting better through things like TensorFlow Lite and like mm -hmm. nice interpreters, but there's still limitations in terms of what you can do. Um, I will, I'll add two more things. So one, um, Edge is really great if you have spotty Wi-Fi um, or mm -hmm. if you don't have Wi-Fi at all. Um, and also, you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate of privacy and security. And I know like, so is Microsoft, which is a big reason why I'm here. Um, but, you know, even, even when something is totally or I shouldn't say totally secure, but even when something is secure, there are certain things I'm still hesitant about doing, right? So I'm using this to take pictures of my trash and like, I don't mind showing it in educational purposes, but in general, I don't really want people to have access to photos of things that I'm throwing away. We're like random photos of me in my personal life. I, I am a very private person when I'm offline. And so, you know, if, if, if you're very concerned about privacy, if maybe you're worried about your Wi-Fi connection, um, or you're on a public Wi-Fi, like keep it local. And then you can, you know, send um, blurred images or encrypted data up to the cloud. But I love edge devices because it allows you to really control what, mm -hmm. you know, people might or might not have access to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a big, <laughs> it's a big trade off. I mean, like I have these nest cameras around my house, right? I mean, I, 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 I don't, I like it. I don't like it. You know, I have friends come over. I make sure I turn them off, you know, just like out of respect of, you know, unless they're like, okay with it. But like it, it, it's the trade off. Cause it's so easy to set up. It's nice to have them for my own personal kind of like mental well being. I'm just like, Oh, I'm safe. You know, I feel safe. But at the same time, all this stuff's going into the Google cloud. I'm just like, I don't know if I like that. It's not. <laughs> it's one yeah. thing. It's one reason why I really love working at Microsoft. Like we protect your data and you also, you can, you are the one who can protect your data in the cloud side too, and who has access to your data. And, you know, I'm a big fan of Brad Smith. He's our big SELA guy, you know, um, and he's always fighting for privacy rights uh, with the government. And so uh, that's one reason why I really value being part of this this company. It sounded like a plug <laughs> for Microsoft, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, I think that's super important because uh, if you are sending it to a cloud, you want to make sure it's safe um, and that it's secure. And uh, so that's, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Robert. And one other thing is I always get asked, what is my favorite IoT connected device that I have in my home? And I always say the only one is the ones I build. <laughs> I don't, I don't actually own, a, <laughs> you know, a, a Nest or anything like that, uh, just because my background is hacking and uh, uh, you know, white hat hacking and, and everything else. And so I'm, I'm perfectly okay. <laughs> Just uh, keeping with the devices. I know uh, what the code is on there and, and where it's being said. Yeah. I feel you, Pamela. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things. I, I've just bought my first connected device in my house because I just moved, but it's just mm -hmm. a hue light bulb. So it's like, you know, I don't think it has any microphone. I don't think it has anything. So it's, it should be all right. <laughs> I saw Carl's hand. <laughs> there's, so, uh, no, there's a lot you can infer based on human behavior, regardless of the actual sensors built into the device. I'm just saying that. <laughs> Data goes a long way, and, and there's a lot of inference that you can do if you have enough of it. 
That's but it's why okay. You in because I that's love you. you in. We want the expert. I have <laughs> lots of two light bulbs in one room in my house. <laughs> and another thing to keep in mind is when, um, if someone has like, let's say, a light bulb. I'm not saying light bulbs are don't don't fear right. that it's well, a, a security fine. vulnerability yeah, at this them. moment. I'm not saying that, but you know, a great reminder, a, a story. I always like to point to this this one um, hack that was done um, uh, for for those security nerds out there. Uh, so there was a fish tank at a casino, and uh, you know they were actually able to access the network through that fish yeah. tank, where yeah. it had sensors on the fish tank and be able to go to Wi-Fi that way. Because uh, it's, it's always one of those things people are like, but I it it doesn't. You know, it's it's just a connected light, a light or a fish tank. You know, it's fine. It's not collecting my data. It's collecting my fish data. But really, it's it's how you can get to the network if it's not secure. Um, so those are I'm gonna stop geeking out in that area <laughs> because I can talk forever about that. Next time, next time I buy uh, a smart device, I call I call you guys up for for some assistance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> happy. To but. <know>. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. No, I mean, we, we ran out by quite a lot, actually. So I'm conscious of people's time. Um, so I, I wanted to close. But before doing that, I just wanted to give you guys a chance to like do any shameless plug at the end. Do you got any? Do you have anything that you want to share with us? Okay, I've already it? used hers up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the one. The great. Is this Spider-Man? Awesome. <laughs> Um, yeah, totally. So um, I'll shamelessly plug my team's projects. So everything that we're building is open source. We have a website. Um, I am going to say it wrong, so I'm just going to really quickly pull it up so I can read it. Microsoft.github.io slash makers, and we will share that. All of our projects um, are there. Um, most of our projects are being hosted on GitHub. You can find the Trash Classifier project tutorial on Adafruit Learn, woo -woo, Adafruit. Um, also on Hackster and Instructables if you have a different uh, platform preference. Um, but otherwise, all of our projects are on GitHub and we love community contributions. We've had some folks at Microsoft contribute to our Raspberry Pi resources repo, which is super awesome. Um, and we're building some Azure Pi recipes that are end to end and as low cost and transparent about cost as possible. Um, so if you have any requests or questions, like by all means, we're an open door team, please bug us. We would love to hear from you. Cool. And Paula, you go, you go next. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, so my shameless plug is my Twitter handle. <laughs> And the fact that uh, Microsoft, we do have, we spent a really long time uh, building a bunch of different tutorials and love to get your feedback on it, but hands-on tutorials uh, at MS Learn um, and that we have uh, have a tech community too. Uh, so if you want to join our tech community and share your projects, we're on there. Uh, we want to hear from you, hear your feedback. If you're having issues with anything we showed today or you know, you're just trying to build IoT device and need need some assistance or you know you're just overwhelmed with you know the 50 billion devices you can choose for your iot solution reach out to us on the um aka.ms iot tech community uh because we would love love to hear from you and then we have a video channel um as well uh that uh, i believe is is uh put on 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 the screen. Uh, so I run a couple different deep dives. I'm going to be hosting a bunch of different series and hope to have all of you guys on a future episode with us uh, on that channel. So if you want to geek out about IoT, for, feel free to subscribe to that channel. Thank you so much. And we really, I, I was talking for you, Jen, too. Uh, really enjoyed being here with all of you. And we're excited that uh, you guys guys invited us to to be speakers here and thank you everyone for for watching as well we really appreciate it yeah thank you I, I forgot to mention actually why we named the episode as we named it is after you Pamela because you do the deep dives right so so yes. it was kind of like <laughs> I forgot to mention that I was I was I had it in mind at the beginning and then I forgot it but <laughs> but yeah go watch uh Pamela does a lot of cool deep dives so yeah uh, I think I'm going to be on one of those next to watch. I'm going to watch them all, actually. I've, I've started, and there's a lot of them, so <laughs> it's taking me a while. Yeah. yeah. But, pa Pamela and Jen, I, I mean, I just wanted to thank you as well. So th thank you very much for your time. I know everyone's time here is, is very valuable, and we really appreciate you 
joining us here. And I'm sure our, our viewers as well appreciate that. And as to the viewers, thank you for giving us your time, especially these bonus 21 minutes. Uh, Carl Alessandro, my favorite co-host. So yeah, thank, thank you everyone. Oh. And um, <laughs> also just don't forget if you are watching this, check the description below because we have talked about a lot of resources today. Uh, make sure you check that out. Also like the video <laughs> and subscribe. Yeah. All right, back over to you, Alessandro. Cool. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you guys for, uh, Pamela and Jen, for being on this. And uh, yeah, all the viewers. And thank you, Carl, for being an expert on the show. No, thank yeah, you for hey, joining sir. us as well. <laughs> it was, it, we were meant to bring you in earlier, but it was, uh, there was so many was too good. interesting things that it was like, but it's, it was awesome. Thank you guys, everyone, for being on. Yay, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.